This video is brought to you by really nice people that support me on Patreon. I greatly appreciate all of your support and if you yourself would like to help support the channel or help me and my wife pay our rent, then the link is in the description below. Thank you, much love. For most of its existence, video games have largely catered towards male audiences, offering action-packed sequences where violence towards another is the driving mechanic that's required to progress and finish a product. In the early days, you were just a guy with a weapon placed into a world where your only objective was to destroy all the enemies or be destroyed yourself. Sometimes you'd get a little bit of story as set dressing, but characterization was minimal. Your character was a tool and that was about it. This was around the late 80s and early 90s, an era where the media largely celebrated hypermasculine ideals, especially in movies. During this time, action movies became obscenely popular and along with it, the action star, strong, capable men who can take on insurmountable odds that embody many men's idealized versions of masculinity. They're powerful, with towering physiques, chiseled jawlines, desirable by women, aspirational for men. Action movies may have allowed audiences to witness masculine power fantasies, but video games allowed us to participate in them. We're given a character in a world that opposes them, told that they have the power to overcome this opposition, and you as the player are required to use the character's inherent abilities to achieve the game's prescribed goal. Countless video games work off this premise, many of which mirror the format of the classic action movie hero, some unabashedly so, wearing their influence on their sleeve. The manliest of men throwing themselves headfirst into dangerous environments, taking matters into their own hands, mating out justice as they see it, sometimes saving others, others searching for glory. Take for example the Gears of War series. These games adhere to this formula to an almost parodical degree, where you play as the titular Gears, a platoon of grizzled soldiers whose physiques look like a quarterback crossbred with a house. They rarely show vulnerability, risk their lives without much thought for their own, and gleefully tear through enemies in a gory fashion. There are some moments of levity and tragedy in these games, but like many of your typical male action heroes, these characters, especially in the franchise's early entries, are coded as Western society's long-established ideals of what men should be. In more recent times though, there's been sort of a reassessment on the kind of men that we see in our games, and while the majority of the industry's biggest titles are largely focused around a gameplay loop of combat and violence, it seems some developers have taken the opportunity to use the popularity of certain titles as a vehicle to promote alternative modern notions on what constitutes a man and places the player in their shoes, utilizing video games' unique selling point of audience participation to create empathy and possibly introspection. What's interesting though is that in many ways this new wave of men bear many similarities to their so-called peers, being extremely competent and powerful and sometimes sharing very similar goals. What's different though is how they eschew the typical expectations of male protagonists and the more restrictive elements of masculinity, whether this is innate to their characterization or something that's developed over time. On the surface, they are the embodiment of masculinity, but these games demonstrate that under that veneer, there's a human being who understands the value of caring for others and in certain situations, a soft touch can be vastly more powerful than an iron fist. So as a little heads up, as part of this discussion there are going to be some slight spoilers for some games. Nothing so much that it'll ruin the entire experience of them for you or anything like that. If and when I do cover something that might be considered a major spoiler, I'll be sure to mention it in advance and include a time code for when it's over. In recent years, media as a whole has become more amenable to the idea of men being more emotionally complex, especially within the mainstream. 
It used to be the case that more in-depth case studies of masculinity were more subtle or relegated to more niche media, like lower budget productions. With media that's more mainstream, it used to be the case that men's personalities and reactions were largely dictated by what happens in a plot, and their history played only a minor role in relation to who they are as a person. They could be heroic, but that might just be because the writer wants them to be that way, or maybe they had a mentor to instill those values. They might be angry or vengeful due to their circumstances, perhaps a villain hurt them or the people that they love, but the importance of these backgrounds were minimal. They exist as a stand-in for the audience, and therefore there are blanks left for us to be filled in. This is fully applicable to video games, and although many characters do receive some fleshing out and motivation for their actions, in the past it wasn't very common to see characters stop and reflect upon what they're doing. What mattered to them is that their enemies fall, and the player is given the satisfaction of helping their avatar complete the task. Kratos from the God of War series has had his personality reformed in the last two entries of the franchise, with God of War 2018 and the more recent God of War Ragnarok. In the original God of War trilogy and its spin-offs though, Kratos was a drastically different person, someone who was entirely driven by rage and a desire for revenge. After a lifetime of manipulation by the gods of Olympus and being tricked into killing his wife and child by the then current god of war Ares, he made it his singular goal to kill him and eventually the rest of the gods. Throughout the course of these games, Kratos eventually accomplishes his goals using his extraordinary strength and combat skills, while performing gratuitous acts of gory violence, all in great detail, while allowing the player to participate and conduct Kratos' cruelty. Whilst his anger is understandable and desire for justice warranted, the brutality of Kratos' actions is questionable and bordering on the perverse. One thing to bear in mind is that these games were made during an era in gaming where this was sort of the norm. Long-time gamers were entering adulthood, and therefore the desire for more adult experiences in gaming grew. And with the increasing fidelity of video games on more powerful hardware, developers were able to accommodate their desire for mature experiences. Since violence has always had an appeal in entertainment among male audiences, game studios catered to this, and fewer excelled at it like Santa Monica Studios and the God of War series. Honestly, I can't even show you the more graphic things in this game without blurring it out because YouTube would age restrict this video in a heartbeat, but it's safe to say that Kratos' brutality may exist for his catharsis as a character, but it also exists for the player, and demographically speaking, in the mid-2000s, that was more than likely a 17-26 to 26 year old male. Outside of the violence, the games also catered to Kratos' and indeed the audience's more carnal desires with the inclusion of... What's an advertiser-friendly way of saying this? Um, romantic wrestling minigames where the camera pans away from the action and you hear various groans from Kratos' female partner, along with numerous remarks on his ability to satisfy her. To this day, I can't tell whether these scenes were supposed to be genuinely titillating or something that the developers included that's tongue-in-cheek and ludicrous. All I know is that a lot of players probably had a very difficult time explaining to their parents what they were playing and what all those noises were. Also, if you want a good example of America's attitude towards sex and violence, um, look no further than these games. Graphic and highly detailed depictions of someone getting their head ripped off? No problem, go for it. Two consenting adults enjoying some adult time in something that's aimed at adults? Well, we can't have that, there might be children watching. I did a whole video on this subject, it's up there in the corner if you want to watch it. No one else did. When the series was rebooted back in 2018, the developers of the game decided to make some drastic changes to Kratos' character and utilize the seemingly shallow and solipsistic personality of the man people grew to know in the past entries to make someone whose thirst for vengeance has now manifested as regret and led him to not only lament upon his past self, but to fear the kind of man his son will become with Kratos being his sole parental figure. 
After escaping from his homeland, Kratos finds himself in the realm of Midgard, living in seclusion. The story begins with us seeing that Kratos' wife Faye has passed away, and as a final wish, she asks that he and his son Atreus are to scatter her ashes atop the highest peak in the Nine Realms. In the first run of the God of War franchise, on his course to destroy the gods of Olympus, Kratos learns that he's actually one of Zeus's many offspring, and eventually he's slain at the hand of Kratos. This parental dynamic is further analysed in God of War 2018. Zeus's failure as a father and his eventual patricide haunts Kratos, and given that Atreus has inherited godhood through him, he fears that the same will happen between them. In both Olympus and Midgard, the gods are portrayed as petty, power-hungry, selfish beings, something which Kratos is also guilty of. He believes that since this is the true nature of gods, that eventually it'll lead to the dissolution of their relationship and possibly one or both of their deaths. As God of War and God of War Ragnarok progresses, we see Kratos grow as a person, a god, and a father. For most of the game's runtime, Kratos still sees violence as the answer to some problems, but unlike his past self, he at times actively attempts to avoid conflict. He also takes time to teach his son that fighting should only be used as a means of survival. Kratos wants to guide Atreus and help him avoid making the same mistakes that he made, teaching him the responsibility that comes with being a god, but at the same time he resents his own godhood and the gods as a whole. He fears inevitability and fears that because of who he is, his history and his failure to understand Atreus, the vicious cycle of parental strife will continue. Over time, Kratos learns that there's only so much that he can do as a father, and that despite his incredible godlike strength, there are simply some things that no amount of power can change, and that is a person's desire to fight for their individualism and independence. By trying to mould Atreus in his ideal image that's been informed by his mistakes, Kratos, ironically, is repeating the sins of his father, Zeus, who controlled his life from afar. He learns to trust Atreus, seeing his empathy not as a weakness but a strength, that he was wrong to tell him to harden his heart for the sake of self-preservation and godhood should be used to help those in need. You could argue that Kratos' brutality being present in these games is counterintuitive to his newfound stance on avoiding conflict, but it is something that's utilised against those who are an unrelenting threat, whether it's beasts or other gods. He's not a remorseless killer that he was in the past games, he's more considerate about his choices, and what those choices may look like to Atreus. Importantly, he learns to trust his son, and accepts that he's capable of making his own decisions, even if that means making mistakes, and as a parent, he shouldn't be angry when that happens, he should just be there for his son and help him make amends. As video game characters go, it's rare to see such an extraordinary and touching transformation that's handled so deftly, an especially difficult task when you consider what they had to work with prior to the reboot. Moving on, let's look at two characters from the other side of the world, Kiryu Kazuma and Ichiban Kasuga from the Yakuza series, which in the future will apparently now be called Like a Dragon, because it wasn't already confusing enough for newcomers to figure out which order to play these games. Both of these characters are men who were troubled youths, Kiryu being orphaned at a young age and raised in an orphanage with the support of Shintaro Kazuma, captain of the Dojima family, who became his foster father. After years of idolising Kazuma, Kiryu insisted on joining the Yakuza and was accepted at the age of 17. Ichiban was abandoned as an infant and ended up in the care of an adoptive father while living in a soapland establishment. If you're not sure what a soapland is, um, just google it. He was also raised by a collective of people who worked at the soapland, along with the community of Kamarocho, who were considered the dregs of society. After losing his adoptive father in his teenage years, Kasuga dropped out of high school, becoming a delinquent, but Due to a chance encounter with the Yakuza family head, he eventually found guidance. In their 20s, both men end up being imprisoned voluntarily. 
Kiryu for taking the blame for a friend who committed a murder, and Ichiban doing the same for another Yakuza family member who resented him, after being asked to do so by the family's patriarch, Masama Arakawa, whom he idolized. Kiryu and Ichiban served their time in prison, but throughout that time they held on to their beliefs and a code of honour, which required them to be good, selfless people who put others ahead of themselves. They care deeply about the people close to them and are willing to make massive sacrifices for them. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that the idea of sacrifice does have some links to masculinity and its more toxic components, with the belief that men should endanger and undervalue their lives so long as it helps others achieve a greater good, and it indeed can be problematic, but in the story of Yakuza, it's used as a way of highlighting the extremes Kiryu and Ichiban will go to to uphold their code, and without spoiling anything, their time in prison isn't treated as something that was worthwhile, and arguably a mistake. What's important though is that both Kiryu and Ichiban ultimately use their strength for good. They never use it with malicious intent, and they understand the responsibility that comes with strength. Kiryu draws his strength from his desire to help others, and while Ichiban does the same, he fights alongside others and helps them find their own strength. The Yakuza games have gained a reputation for its huge variety of goofy side quests and mini games which border on the absurd, but they do a great job at highlighting how far Kiryu and Ichiban are willing to go to help others, even if it involves doing something that's embarrassing or out of character for them. On the surface, you would think that Kiryu is the embodiment of masculinity, but he's far more than that. He's willing to have fun, be expressive, dance, listen to others, be vulnerable, and cry. Ichiban is similar to Kiryu in these respects, but he's far more warmer on the surface, being an endless well of positivity, inspiring others that he comes into contact with, cheering them on, and turning foes into close friends with ease. His positivity is disgustingly infectious, and you can't help but love him, even moments after starting his story. They've both lived hard lives, experienced devastating losses, but they still stand by their will to do good. They don't resent their lot, or spend their lives investing time and effort into hating those who have brought them misery, because they know that time is better spent caring for others. Kiryu and Ichiban teach us that we should keep trying our hardest for the people we love, even when they make it really hard to love them. Okay, here's a heads up for some spoilers here for the end of Yakuza Like a Dragon, but I'll keep it brief. Throughout Like a Dragon, Ichiban is put through the ringer by the game's main antagonist, Ryo Aoki, otherwise known as Masato Arakawa. He orders the death of dozens of people, including his own father, with the goal of maintaining power and in the process hurting Ichiban. He's a ruthless, angry man who's solely driven by his desire for power and dominion over others, a villain that's truly easy to hate. He's been upfront with how much he's hated Ichiban since they were very young, but Ichiban refuses to see him as irredeemable. He's not so naive that he sees Masato as innocent, but he wants him to see that what he's doing is wrong. After Ichiban finally defeats Masato, there's no climactic scene where he delivers the final blow. No explosions, no gunshots exchanged between the two or anything like that. Ichiban talks Masato down. He tells him that even though he doesn't believe it, he's always been loved and that he still sees him as a brother. He begs and pleads with him with a profound display of emotion and tears streaming down his face to accept his words and turn himself in. It's such an incredibly well handled moment and as a fan of the series, it made me glad that we'll have someone like Ichiban taking over the role that Kiryu has filled all these years. If you've never played the Yakuza games, let me just say that even though you may have seen the memes, the gifs, and the videos of all the ridiculous stuff that you see in them, these games tell a damn good story. They're like an over-the-top soap opera show, but if you don't feel something while playing Like a Dragon or Yakuza 0, then I don't know what to tell you. 
Also, if masculinity keeps me from pulling some sick shapes on the disco dance floor with my boys on a Friday night, or keeps me from starring in my own bubblegum pop video, then yeah, good luck selling the other benefits. Welcome to the Boost Bus. The segment in each video where I take a moment to promote small content creators who could do with your help in defeating the algorithms. If you saw my last video, you'll remember that from now on we'll be promoting two creators per video. So without further ado, I'd like to start out with Liam and his YouTube channel Millennial Model Mayhem. Try saying that five times first. Liam's channel focuses largely on the joy of painting and constructing models, especially Gundam model kits, a hobby which is otherwise known as Gunpla. Gunplay. Gunpla. Gunpla. That one. Liam lovingly explains his process in a way that encourages others to explore their creativity in a positive and healthy fashion, and attempts to combat the gatekeeping which can be all too common with niche hobbies such as this. Something that I can attest to after those fascists at Games Workshop spoke to me with contempt when I first tried to buy paint from them when I was 14 years old. Don't think I've forgotten about you, Keith. Liam has a background in painting miniatures for tabletop games and recognises the crossover potential between the two hobbies, and in his video he demonstrates his meticulous hand painting techniques, all while sharing some lovely insights on his life and the world at large. All of his videos are extremely well edited and produced, they include some ASMR elements and plenty of quirky and unique humour that tickled my funny bone, so check him out and give him some support. Secondly, there's Noelle Aman and her channel Amelie Dori. Noelle creates video essays about often untranslated Japanese media, with a particular focus on the genre of eroge, which is extremely bold of her to talk about on YouTube of all places. She offers her unique perspective as a trans woman, exploring the complex and remarkably progressive themes found within many of these video games, which are largely unknown by players outside of Japan. Her work as an indie game musician has had an influence on her work, along with content creators such as Hazel, Intellectual Media, and Hbomagai. Her work includes a look at Jisatsu 101, an unfinished horror visual novel which is notable for its depictions of mental health, among other things, where Noelle applies an analysis based on their own struggles with identity and life experiences. There's also one on Fushigi Densha, a bizarre and seemingly nonsensical game which has a gender swap Che Guevara, cryptic metaphors and surrealist art, which Noelle explores through the lens of capitalist realism. Given YouTube's puritanical stance on what's deemed appropriate on this site, Noelle could benefit from all the support that she can get to continue with her fine work, so go help her out. The links for both of these creators are in the description below. If you're a content creator and would like a ride on the Boost Bus, please send one email to solarivideo at gmail.com. Please be sure to include your pronouns, a brief bio about yourself and your work, along with links to your sites and socials. If you're an artist, then please include high quality samples to be used in the video. I will be able to respond to your emails due to the volume, but rest assured they are all being read. Also, later on in the video, you'll see me again, and I've got longer hair. Uh, I, I got a haircut between these things. Don't know why I felt like I needed to mention that, but yeah. If we're talking about positive representations of masculinity though, there's one man that absolutely deserves to be included in this conversation. One of my favorite characters in fiction, Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2. I will say as an aside that even though I absolutely cannot condone the excessive amount of labour that went into the creation of this game and Rockstar Games' treatment of its staff throughout the development cycle, the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 is, in my opinion, a masterpiece, and despite the circumstances that it was created under, everyone who was involved in the creation of it deserves recognition, so please don't take my praise as me commending the actions of the studio and their labour practices. Like the other characters I've mentioned, Arthur Morgan has had a difficult past, losing his mother at a young age and then his abusive father at the age of 11, which then led to a life of delinquency before being taken in by Dutch Vanderlind and Hosea Matthews, who took on the role of surrogate fathers. The two taught Arthur everything that he needs to know to survive in a dangerous world, how to hunt, fight, shoot, 
fish, read, write, and of course, how to ride a horse. Arthur became enamored with Dutch's desire for freedom from the yoke of modern society. To be independent outside of the constraints of the law and norms of a country that hypocritically claims to be civilized, despite its shameless savagery masquerading as justice. Red Dead Redemption 2 does have a morality system built into the game, so to speak. There are occasions in which you can choose how Arthur behaves in a given situation. If you kill innocents indiscriminately or perform selfish actions in a questline, then the game adjusts your good and bad alignment. These decisions can affect the overall outcome of the story, so in this case we're going to examine Arthur as someone who chooses to be good. Given the open world nature of the game, your experience with it outside of the story can paint Arthur differently from person to person, since if you wanted to, you could go around mercilessly killing every innocent person that you see, so for this example, let's not see him as that person. Plus, to be honest, I admittedly don't know much about the differences when playing Arthur as a bad person because I'm one of those people who'll load up a two hour old save game if I accidentally say something mean to an NPC. Arthur is ultimately a tragic character. He's a man who for most of his life has been led astray and used by Dutch with the empty promise of true freedom. Many of his actions have been influenced by Dutch and his manipulations, and given how much Arthur looks up to him, it's understandable how someone in his situation wouldn't question the morality of their actions while being instructed by someone you believe knows better than you. Dutch is followed by a band of people who are ostensibly misfits who struggle to find a place in society, whether that's due to gender, race, nationality, profession, illness, or outlaws who refuse to accept how the world is changing. He sells dreams of libertarian-flavored independence, and to these followers it's a lucrative proposition, albeit one that's impossible for them to achieve, and Dutch knows it. As Arthur's journey throughout Red Dead 2 progresses, he learns the value of helping others under the initial intention of helping out himself. He's close to his comrades, understands their desires for a better life, and sees that same desire in strangers, eventually realizing that Dutch's dream of a libertarian paradise comes at the cost of harming others, including those who are supposedly family. Arthur also refuses to discriminate against others, despite living during an era in which attitudes towards minorities and women were almost universally negative. He recognizes women as being just as capable as any of the men in his life, empathizes with people of color, and doesn't tolerate bigotry, as made evident by his refusal to put up with the eugenics nonsense spouted by this guy, and if you happen to stumble upon a certain group of people who like wearing white hoods, Arthur makes it very clear how they disgust him too. In his heart, Arthur is a good man who has been swayed by a con man, but it's understandable. Having known Dutch since he was a child, and seeing how people hang on to his every word, everything he says comes across as infallible. It's only after Dutch starts making mistakes that cost the gang gravely that Arthur starts to see the flaws in the man, and begins to reflect upon the damage that he personally has caused while under his command. Good people can do bad things when under the guidance of people whose words carry enough weight. Arthur is a victim of circumstance, just like everyone else in the gang, but he still takes accountability for his actions. Driven by guilt and a need to atone for his actions, Arthur goes to great lengths to do right by people, helping the needy, defending those who can't defend themselves, and desperately trying to make amends with those that he's wronged, which heartbreakingly doesn't always work out, leaving Arthur to come to terms with the fact that some of the damage he's caused simply can't be undone. Beneath the gruff exterior, there's a tenderness to Arthur Morgan. He cares deeply for others, is capable of being loving and even mushy, but he's been constantly told to be selfish. He's emotionally open, vulnerable, respectful, kind, and more selfless than he himself likes to believe. 
Okay, spoiler territory once again. This time it's about the game's ending, which I'm sure most of you know about anyway, um, but here's your time code. In the closing parts of the game, Arthur is diagnosed with tuberculosis, which he caught after collecting debts from a man who dedicated his life to helping others. And since antibiotics didn't exist in 1899, Arthur is guaranteed to die. Knowing this, he dedicates his final days trying to be a better man, the kind of man he realises that he always wanted to be. This desire to be better is palpable, going as far as putting his life on the line for people that he knows are impossible to help, no matter how many bullets he fires at their enemies or how much money he puts in their pockets. He is desperate to be buried knowing that he did some good in this world, good that won't be forgotten by as many people as possible. The story slows down on these occasions to give him time to reflect on who he is and how other people see him, most notably in two side quests where he helps a recently widowed woman who used to live in a city by teaching her how to survive off the land, and another where he finds companionship in a war veteran who lives in the wilds. These two get to witness the goodness in Arthur and are able to recognise it as what defines him as a man, even after learning of his past actions. Arthur is racked with guilt though, and no amount of kind gestures or sacrifice seems to alleviate it. With the gang in disarray and Dutch, along with his snivelling yes-man Micah and a few cohorts' as betrayal, as a final act of kindness, Arthur takes it upon himself to ensure that John Marston, the protagonist from Red Dead Redemption 1, and his family escape safely and flee from Dutch and the law. He takes his last horseback ride to the camp to confront Dutch, and the game reflects upon Arthur's actions, hearing the words of those that he's tried to help. Upon reaching Dutch, the gang scatter to the winds after being found by law enforcement, leaving Arthur to expend what little energy he has left to help John escape with his life. As they flee, Arthur's horse is gunned down. Amidst the chaos, he gives it a loving goodbye for all the time that they shared together. Eventually, the men part ways. Arthur gives John what money he has remaining and is forced to fight Dutch's right-hand man, Micah, which is interrupted by Dutch himself before either man lands a killing blow. Left alone on the mountain, bloodied, broken, and with failing organs that refuse to provide him with any more life, Arthur dies seeing the sun rise on a day that he won't see through until the end, but someone else will because of him. I have played through Red Dead Redemption 2 twice, and both times I openly sobbed at this ending, even when I knew what was coming. I had to pause it to compose myself, and it's because I lost Arthur, a character so impeccably realised, so virtuous, so eager to be good, that the thought of him dying just broke me. I have a great deal of attachment to all of these characters, and I know a lot of other people do too. A big reason why people have become fans of these games is because of the people that you play as, and many people who reject traditional ideas of masculinity love these characters because of what they represent. They're all men of action, and these games don't shy away from the fact that they're capable of violence, but they don't relish having to fight. They fight to survive or to help others survive. Outside of thrown fists and gunshots, they're men who have learned to care about others, who use their power to oppose those who are abusing their power and aren't afraid to show their humanity. Of course, there are a lot of men out there who aren't a fan of this softness. The ones who think that Kratos should still be the kind of man who'd throw a woman under the bus if it meant he got to cross the street faster, or ones who get annoyed because Red Dead Redemption as a series doesn't portray itself as a chaotic playground of destruction like its sister franchise Grand Theft Auto. I can't help but feel that these are the men who would benefit the most from these characters though, and see this medium as something more than just the catharsis that comes from playing. Growing up, I wasn't really able to attach myself to media that contained hypermasculine portrayals of men. 
future I could have some fun watching an action movie or playing a video game where you're given a gun and told to shoot the baddies, but beyond seeing certain characters as cool or whatever, there was a part of me that wanted to see more of myself in them. Like, I love the Devil May Cry games, but what does Dante bring to the table? And no, I'm not saying that he should be rebooted as a deep, meaningful, sympathetic character. Dante is just Dante, and that's fine. But I am glad that I and other men are now getting more portrayals of male characters that are unabashedly masculine, but contain more positive and healthy traits that players can aspire to, that men can aspire to. There are certain spheres in online discourse in which people lament the loss of the hypermasculine man in media that showing any kind of softness diminishes the image of men and it isn't true to what men should be like for a so-called ideal society where the people in charge make emotionless calculated decisions and value power above all else. A willingness to show vulnerability and make choices based on empathy isn't a bad thing though. It allows people to come to a consensus on what's beneficial to everyone and how people's needs can be met. Conflict avoidance is a good thing and so is choosing to be kind and selfless. We already have enough evidence to see how damaging selfishness can be. Most of us are victims to it in our everyday lives. Positive role models in media go a long way in crafting the people that we become and having those in our video games can be especially powerful since it places you directly in their shoes, sometimes asking you to make choices and sometimes asking you to understand why characters make these choices. I also think that it's great that we're seeing more diversity in our protagonists. There's immense value in playing as people from different backgrounds and I'd like to see more of it. The idea that men are being erased from games though simply isn't true, even though people like to claim that it is. They will always exist, just like they will in the real world, but there always comes a time for evolution. Gaming has just matured and learned to tell more stories about the power of being considerate and caring while avoiding making the same mistakes. Or as Kratos once put it, We must be better. Thank you very much for watching. If you did like this video, then luckily there is a like button below it that you can click and it really helps out. You can also subscribe, leave a comment, maybe mention a uh, character that you really like. I'd be happy to read whatever you have to say. I'd also like to offer a special shout out to all of my patrons that donate $5 or more each month. And that goes out to Potato Times, Mech, Fatey1703, Ellisren, Joseph Blair, Jonathan Morris, Sean, Rose Jane, Caro Schultz, Mason, Bailey Greveling, in a Borat voice, my wife, Girls on Bear, Christian Moyer, Catherine Pandel, Azil Crescent, Candide, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Grant B, Murgurgo Fashionable, Alina, LEB, R Atoms, Games, Charfay, Mickey Buonadonna, Sparrow Wagon, Ruby O'Connor, Thomas Tomacano, Tadeo De Oria, Ryan Osterman, Alicia Crawford, Jay, Catherine, Lizzie Peasy, King Me, and finally, Fishcatch. Thank you all so very, very much for supporting the channel. It really does make a huge difference and it really helps me uh, continue uh, growing. So, thank you. Also, I've been streaming on Twitch more often recently, so go follow me there at twitch.tv slash jsolari. We have a lot of fun. It's a nice time. I've included a link to it in the description below. As a thank you for making it to the end of the video, enjoy this footage of our cats getting belly rubs and me risking everything by touching their paws. You can also see what it looks like to give a cat an inhaler. Uh, one of our cats is unfortunately asthmatic and this is what we have to do to make sure he takes his medication. It's very sad but he's a good boy and he doesn't make it too troublesome. But anyway, once again, thanks for watching. Sorry that it took a little bit longer than usual to release this video. Uh, me and my wife have been dealing with some things, but hopefully it shouldn't be so infrequent in the future. Uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and I'll see you next time, alright? Bye-bye.